Thank you all for joining us today in the third installment of our virtual coffee chat with the Science Diplomat series. We're very glad to have Minister Councillor Christian Jorgens, the head of science, the head of section for science and technology at the Embassy of Germany to the US with us here today. Uh, I'll open with a quick note that our coffee chats are normally about 45 minutes start to finish in order to allow you to work these into your busy day. Um, but I will start today's chat just by mentioning that given Germany's current presidency, of the EU Council and the fact that Christian will speak a bit about the quote unquote job description of a science diplomat will likely tack on an extra 15 minutes or so. Uh, so please join us for as little or as long as you'd like. And thank you again for being here uh, today to watch live. And rather than read his bio, uh, which I know many of you are familiar with, I'll just jump right into this uh, over a cup of coffee. So Christian, thank you for being here. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to, to ask you, what was your educational and career path that brought you to your current position in science diplomacy? Uh, as we learned with our previous two, two speakers and interviewees in the last month's virtual coffee chats, there's really no standard path to the job or to the field. Um, first of all, uh, Jackson, thank you very much um, for hosting me. Um, I, um, <clears throat> my, excuse me, um, the weather has become a little bit colder, <laughs> it seems. So um, it, it was a pleasure to work with you um, on, on the preparation of this uh, webinar, and I, um, uh, I enjoyed um, remembering a lot of um, um, my career in, in science diplomacy. Um, my, my personal approach uh, uh, um, started actually uh, in, in my family, because my, uh, my father was a scientist, um, and uh, he had many international contacts, Japan, Hungary, United States, uh, I experienced two of his sabbaticals, one in Denmark, one uh, in the United States, University of uh, Colorado at, uh, at Boulder. So um, um, the, the notion that um, the idea that science is international and that scientists work together internationally was, was actually uh, with me uh, at a rather early stage. And uh, so uh, I, I, I wanted to, to stay in, in, in science. Um, I knew uh, that much. and. Um, um, my background is, is actually a lawyer. I'm, uh, I um, uh, started in international law at the University of Göttingen. And uh, then when um, uh, the decision came to, um, after my bar exam, to um, move into uh, a professional career, um, I um, um, experienced, um, um, uh, I, I looked around a little bit and, uh, and the, the closest um, that um, the professional path that came closest to my ideas was um, uh, joining the Ministry of Education and Research, but it's it's international uh, department. It has uh, it had kind of a huge international department um, responsible for the different uh, regions of the world, and that's where I wanted uh, to go. Um, and uh, this this brings us to the to the main um, career. Uh, paths which are actually possible, there um, are some which are a little bit more unusual. Uh, first one, of course, you can become a career diplomat, but then you are not necessarily in science. Uh, you will be maybe science counselor at an embassy for three years, and then you move on to another um, field, uh, e economy, uh, cultural affairs, whatever. Um, so that, that doesn't bring you uh, into science uh, permanently. And um, second is a comment from a ministry that is science related, uh, like the Ministry of Education and Research in Germany, and that's, that's what I did. Um, and you can, can um, be seconded from there to, to an embassy. And the third is maybe um, start as a scientist and then um, move from there to an, to an embassy. We have um, colleagues who were, for example, scientists in Australia, uh, also in the US, and are now um, science counselors at our um, general consulates or, or embassies. So that works as well. The downside is um, um, a pattern, um, um, that in, in that case, um, you um, will lose uh, contact to your discipline uh, after a while and then have difficulties to get back into, into science and research. Um, uh, so, uh, but 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 actually, um, what you uh, what you need is more like you know, the general management skills and experience in international relations, and that you, you can certainly get um, via this path. Um, 
lawyer may sound a bit strange for you, but it's actually quite useful. I, I was responsible for negotiating two US-Germany intergovernmental um, agreements on SNT cooperation during my first term in Washington, which was from 2007 uh, to 2011. Um, and, um, uh, so um, this is uh, there's a lot of IPR involved, um, intellectual proper, property rights, um, and um, uh, I've I've uh, before I, I came to to Washington on my first term, I, I worked in in different uh, uh, other uh, positions like human resources. I, I was responsible for for human resources when uh, the German reunification happened. Uh, that was quite an quite an exciting time. I worked at an international research organization, uh, and I've, I've been um, at the, the German embassy uh, in in Tel Aviv as a science counselor for for two years. So um, that's about um, what I can tell about my my personal responsibility. Uh, I would like to mention another responsibility, which was heading the Asia division at the um, German Ministry of Education and Research. So I was responsible for the um science relations uh, with um uh, with china vietnam india um, and other countries uh, and that's quite a different set of of tasks that you have there but we'll uh, get back um, to that later i guess okay uh, well given your your current position then it sounds like it's your second time back in washington uh, posted to the embassy can you tell us what your current areas of responsibilities are uh, who are your main partners counterparts colleagues well, as you already mentioned, I had the uh, science and technology division of the of the embassy. Uh, right now, I have uh, two um, uh, colleagues who work with me. Uh, uh, I work a lot with the, with the general consulates. Uh, we have uh, full-time science counselors in San Francisco and in Boston, so we are quite a small team uh, comparatively. Uh, I, I work with, a, um, with my ministry, the Ministry of Education and Research in, in Germany, of course, uh, with, a, with a foreign office, and um, uh, I'm in, in, in close uh, contact at the embassy with colleagues who work for the Ministry of Economy, Ministry of Environment, and, and so on. And um, um, other main partners are the, um, the representations of, of German um, research and exchange organizations in the U.S., like the German Academic Exchange Service, DAD, with an office in, in, in Washington, uh, sorry, in New York, uh, DFG, German Research Foundation, uh, with offices in, uh, in Washington and New York. We have uh, universities, university associations, also um, domiciled at the um, so-called German House across from the UN building uh, in New York, and uh, last but not least, um, the um, uh, German-American Chambers of Commerce, because we also do um, uh, apprenticeship programs. Um, they, uh, these chambers have established uh, quite successful uh, apprenticeship programs um, according, uh, based, based on the German model uh, in the US, and we try to promote uh, these, uh, these programs. So um, um, these chambers are also important, uh, Chicago, Atlanta, uh, and so on. Okay, that's fascinating. I think uh, it's been really interesting to see how Germany puts several ministries that collaborate in terms of certain certain areas abroad. So given the fact that you mentioned, I think two or three different ministries uh, that are all involved in in sort of the science and, and technology work, I find there's there's not a lot of countries that have taken that approach. Um, so we've talked I, a I bit don't about- know, actually, but uh, Jackson, if I may mention that uh, the, the um, actually the whole economic department uh, of the embassy, with a few exceptions, um, consists of colleagues who are seconded from Ministry of Economy, Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Education and Research, Environment, and so on. So um, the, 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 at least the German Foreign Office does that a lot, uh, capitalizes, if you wish, um, uh, from the experience uh, of um, the, these um, thematic uh, dedicated uh, ministries. And it's, uh, it's, it's quite nice if you don't have to travel to the Ministry of Economy in, in Berlin, that's quite a distance. And then uh, instead you can just go across the, the, the corridor and talk to the um, uh, colleague from the Ministry of uh, Economy. And it's, uh, that's, that's actually something that is very nice about this um, uh, position. Well, I haven't heard many examples of other countries doing that, so I think there's certainly uh, quite a bit to learn from that approach. 
So we've talked in our earlier questions a little bit about what science diplomacy means. And sometimes in taking that approach, we talk about sort of the philosophy of it and, and you know, what it achieves. But in terms of the nitty gritty, the tasks, the day-to-day -day work, what's actually involved in science diplomacy? Well, here at the embassy, it's uh, it's mostly reporting about developments in in SNT in in the United States, and there is a lot going on and a lot to uh, to report on, like for example, a new program in in, in quantum research or in, uh, artificial intelligence. Um, um, latest developments in the uh, scientific relationship between the U.S. and China, for example, all this kind of of, um, of thing. Uh, we do. Um, um this kind of reporting we try of course to advertise the the science uh, landscape of uh, um the, the, our home country germany uh in in the us um we do that together with the organizations which are already mentioned uh, um, um, German Academic Exchange Service, German Research Foundation, German Aerospace Center, who also has an office here in, in, in Washington, um, Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, and, and so on. So um, uh, advertising, and then of course we try, if necessary, to improve the, the framework conditions for our researchers and students in the, in the US. Uh, you've certainly heard that there were some, some visa, visa issues uh, lately, um, and um, uh, that um, is, is um, certainly something that um, we would uh, try to discuss with, with the State Department and, and come to a, to a solution. And, and now, by the way, the rules are very similar in either direction. Um, the, the, the other, uh, I, I would like to elaborate a little bit on another important task for, for science diplomats because Diplomats, in a wider sense, uh, science diplomacy uh, happens not only in uh, in embassies and general consulates, but also at the ministries. For example, the Department of State here in the U.S. has a, um, its, its own uh, Department of Ocean uh, Environment and Science. Uh, USAID does a lot in, in in this reaction, and the same is true for the, for the um, German ministry. So I was responsible for the uh, Asia Cooperation at the Ministry of Education and Research. And um, uh, um, that uh, is uh, still another task. So, for example, you have to negotiate um, international, intergovernmental, or interministerial agreements on SNT uh, cooperation. Uh, that might be our umbrella re uh, agreements. The US has, has had a lot. Um, it might be on specific matters like energy research, civil security research, and so on. There's, there's a lot of, of work in, involved here, and it's very useful to be a lawyer, uh, by the way. Um, you, you draft strategies for the cooperation with, um, with other countries. For example, um, uh, way back uh, in, in 2011, uh, 2012, we realized that we actually needed a more coordinated um, uh, approach uh, in our uh, research cooperation with China. So what we started was a, was a huge enterprise of um, seven working groups with two uh, full day uh, meetings each and uh, for key technologies for, for um, um, humanities and social sciences and, and so on. And uh, at the end, we put that all together and, and discussed it uh, with our colleagues at the ministry or the foreign office. And then um, it, it went into a, a strategy a paper with a, a catalog of, um, I don't remember, <laughs> 20 uh, d different measures uh, and um, what we wanted to do. And then this, this, this catalog, this, these measures had to be implemented with um, funding opportunity announcements um, for, the, for the different areas of, of, of research and cooperation. Uh, so that, that takes, uh, takes a lot of time. Uh, you lead negotiations with other countries on joint ST programs and projects. Um, the, most of these so-called umbrella agreements for ST cooperation have the provision that there is a, a, a kind of a joint committee, a bilateral committee, which discusses uh, future projects and programs. So you have to prepare these committee meetings uh, and um, uh, you put new, uh, you put up new programs, uh, new f funding opportunity announcements for international collaboration, and you manage the uh, existing programs, of course. So you have to take the funding decisions uh, and 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 so on. This is not in Germany, at least, exclusively done by the ministry, but we have so-called project management agency. So that's that's not a group of uh, of experts uh, which um, are on the contract uh, from the ministry. 
and which do, for example, the, 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 the vetting of, of research proposals, they put together the, um, the expert panels for the peer review and, and so on. So um, it's, uh, I, I had maybe uh, three to four staffers uh, in the ministry, but um, let's say um, at least double the amount at a product management agency. And, and the, these contracts are awarded on a competitive basis, a limited term. So if there's a change in the programs, uh, you can adapt uh, the, the capacities uh, very easily. And, and uh, um, so that's, uh, um, that's something that um, is certainly um, another task for science diplomats in a wider sense. And I, I think it's, it's important to mention. So you, we've talked about the goals and the tasks, and then with your personal background uh, as a lawyer, and I hadn't realized that you'd worked in HR, so there's a lot of skills at play here. Uh, you're probably very uniquely positioned to speak to us about what the skills that are required are, uh, and in particular, the soft skills in, to be a science diplomat. Well, I would say uh, the first, uh, the first uh, is, um, uh, feature that is important is, is, is of course, curiosity. Uh, you shouldn't go into science diplomacy if you're not really, really curious to, to get to know other, other, other people, other nations, how they work, how their science works. And, um, and so, so that's, that's really important. And um, you, you, you should take every opportunity to get to know the, um, your partner country, um, talk with um, Experts, uh, German experts, we, uh, who have, have worked there as, as a scientist, of course, preferably, uh, or with with um, scientists from the from the host country uh, who uh, have an experience with with Germany. So um, um, that's that's uh, that's a given. Um, uh, there's obviously a challenge that is language, um, and um, uh, so um, in, in in many countries you. Um, you won't, uh, the partners will not be willing to talk to you in English. So you have to, um, to use uh, interpretation. Um, a lot of subtext always gets lost when you, uh, when you use interpreters. Uh, you should try to use, uh, to, to bring your own interpreters at, or at least I, I, I tried to have someone who um, was a native speaker or speaks the language well um, to, to the negotiations. And, and even then it, 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 it happened that they, they, they told me, okay, you know, this has not been translated correctly. You now have to answer actually to this question that your uh, counterpart uh, asks. And um, so uh, a lot, uh, a lot of the, the difficulties are, are um, arising in, in that in that area. Uh, negotiating skills is, is important. So we have these these wonderful programs like the um, in the US like the AAAS uh, Science uh, and Technology diplomacy uh, fellowships and um, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure they, they, they teach you that as well but you, you will experience that many people you, you meet in, in foreign countries have great nego negotiating skills so they, they, they know how to test your red lines and, and there's always this good cop bad cop game and uh, testing out uh, how far you, you are willing to compromise and when you are definitely at the point that you walk out so this this is um, this is something that is that is important. Um, uh, complexity. Um, uh, international projects are not less but more complex than national projects uh, because many more stakeholders are involved. So um, they can also in, involve a lot of money. Think about a project to establish a campus of a, of a university in a, in a foreign country that may easily cost, uh, in, including in, in investments in architecture, in, 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 the, in the buildings, in uh, the, the, the whole scientific in infrastructure, may cost up to 200 million US, just to, 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 to name a, a number. And um, so it, it, can, it can be really complex. You need complex legal agreements. Uh, and. And once you are invested in such a project, it's actually very difficult to get out again. So uh, you have to think about the exit. Um, and uh, if something goes wrong, but the exit is in, in difficult in any case because um, it, it, uh, the exit might damage uh, the, the diplomatic relationships, the political relationship uh, with the, the, the partner country. So uh, this, is, this makes uh, international projects a lot more difficult than, than national uh, projects. Of course, there are always smaller programs, smaller projects, just an exchange of scientists. If you do that kind of thing, you can just discontinue it. And, and that's uh, if, if, if you like. 
So um, another thing that I would like to talk about is, <clears throat> is context. <clears throat> Because you are always, excuse me, you are always moving uh, in a in a um, in a foreign context, uh, context, historical, politically, culturally, you have a different uh, context, and you have to uh, to understand that and take it in, into account. And that may be more difficult than you think, uh, because, um, um, for example, <clears throat> the. Um, the notion, the idea that that research institutions and universities have to be independent, that they actually work better and they have a certain uh, degree of autonomy is uh, absolutely self-evident, I think, in, in the US. In Germany, it has been introduced maybe at the beginning of the year 2000 that the universities became really independent, could make their own decisions about hiring professors and so on. In, in other countries, this may be totally new. I have had discussions where uh, it was about um, installing an, a research institute in, in a foreign country. And um, uh, after half an hour of discussion, I realized that my, my, my partners actually understood um, a totally different thing. So I was talking about autonomy, they were talking about responsibility, which is a totally different thing. But in a culture uh, or in, a, in an administrative context, uh, where the ministry determines every detail in a university, this may seem very awkward. Uh, and um, uh, so I, um, I, I don't mean this in any way judgmental, of course. Uh, that's, that's a general waiver that I have to, to, uh, to bring here. Um, and, and that's where the big mistakes happen when you try to push a preconceived idea about how um, 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 your concept that, that you know should work in a foreign country onto that country, it, 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 it never works if you haven't uh, um, discussed it very thoroughly and, and reached agreement. Um, I could name other examples. Uh, we have had this long tradition of apprenticeship in, in, in Germany. That's an example from education. Um, and um, um, this is not very familiar in the US because in the US uh, you, you actually have to see that you get a four year college degree and, and, and that's it. And, and um, the idea that apprenticeship degrees can confer almost the same level of recognition uh, nationwide is, um, is not very familiar. Same in China, by the way, where we also try to, to introduce this. This changes in the US a lot. So the current administration is, is advertising alternative career uh, paths uh, a lot now. Uh, so we are, we are converging maybe a little bit here. Um, or. Um, uh, the, the, the idea that um, um, when, when you try to push a, a technological concept um, in, in another country, that you actually also need to accompany it with education, uh, with, with technical training, because then if you, if you have an, an, an installation, like for example, we, we try to in, introduce decentralized uh, sewage um, plants in, in for, for Chinese um, cities, which are growing very fast, so you have to, to apply a different concept uh, there. And we needed people who were trained to run these, uh, these research uh, demonstration um, sewage plants. And so you have to, to, to think of, of uh, education uh, and, and, and technical training. Um, and then last but not least, um, you have to think about the, the context that you are bringing from your home country, because you, you carry kind of as your baggage, uh, all the um, uh, the history, uh, the, 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 the politics, uh, the culture of your country, and you're speaking for your country. So, um, and, and this, this can be difficult. For example, you know that, that Germany and, and Israel have a kind of a troubled relationship uh, in, in, in the past. Uh, due to the to the Shoah, but if you if you are speaking on German science uh, at a representative uh, um, location like the Knesset in Jerusalem, and there's uh, the head of the science committee of the of the Knesset there, and maybe the research minister, and lots of parents in the audience who are about to send their kids to uh, to some some science experience in, in in foreign countries, maybe also in Germany, um, you have to mention that you have to mention the the um, um, very unhappy history of, of Jewish scientists being um, expelled from German universities after the Nazis came to power, because uh, the people just want to see that you uh, and, and to hear that you remember. So um, all this kind of context is also relevant for science diplomacy. 
Um, and uh, so I, I, I would say uh, don't don't approach this task with uh, um, any kind of exceptionalism. Uh, don't uh, try to get rid of your preconceived ideas. For example, when I went to to, to Israel as a, as a science diplomat, I thought that maybe Orthodox Jewish people might not be that close to to, to science and more focusing on on other things, but. Um, um, when I uh, accompanied a delegation uh, to uh, a, an Israeli university and they wanted to know something about AI and the professor that we met was an orthodox lady and she did amazing research in AI. She used AI to teach teams of robots to work together and um, it, it, was, it was absolutely fascinating. So um, no, no, no preconceived ideas, please. That's uh, my message. I didn't think a, a single question could have so many rich perspectives in an answer in such a relatively short amount of time. So I wish we had three hours to, to keep that, that question going. Uh, perhaps on the flip side of your examples of, for example, setting up German university presence, uh, a German university presence in other countries through agreements, how do you advertise Germany as a location for studies and research? Uh, would that be something that falls exclusively under under your office or department? Or is that in collaboration with several different parts of the embassies and foreign ministry? Uh, and what are the main challenges in, in advertising and promoting Germany as a destination? Um, we, tr we try to do that uh, together with the, with the um, research organizations and their representations in, in, in Germany. And uh, so we have a lot of help here. And actually, uh, I, I would even say they, they do the main work because uh, the main problem, of course, is uh, when, you, when you consider going for study or research to a country like Germany, you need a lot, a lot of detailed information. And they can give you that. And that's why we, we will, will put up on the, on the website some, some um, um, on the Eurex's website, some information uh, on um, who you could actually talk to if you want this detailed information. Uh, what I can do as a science counselor with the limited time that we usually have for our presentations is um, is actually to um, make more to, to give the people a basic uh, um, impression of the science landscape and um, mm, uh, how fun, uh, science funding works in general and um, how, how um, international the atmosphere in, in Germany actually, actually is. Um, so what I, what I try uh, to, um, to say is um, how much the, the German government and society value science. And um, there's a lot that you can mention. We have freedom of science mentioned in our constitution. You know, actually, our, our research institutions are pretty independent from the government because they are not even government. They are uh, like the Department of, of um, uh, Energy National Labs or the, the National Institutes of Health uh, is not part of the federal administration. It's independent private associations like Max Planck, Fraunhofer, uh, and, and so on. So they, they are pretty independent. <clears throat> and um, also, as I mentioned, universities have, have been granted, um, many universities have been granted uh, autonomy. Um, the coalition uh, agreement, which is a basis um, for our government, um, um, says what the science program of the government uh, will be. <clears throat> and there is um, um, the trust in science is uh, is, is is high in in Germany. Actually, it, um, uh, it has uh, Im even improved a little bit uh, during the the pandemic, and we, we have a. Um, uh, a strong commitment of our federal government to um, s and uh, funding, as you know, our chancellor is herself a, a scientist. Um, and um, <clears throat> we have a government-wide strategy, uh, which um, uh, is uh, the so-called high-tech strategy, which coordinates um, uh, science uh, programs over all the, the ministries of the federal government. We try to give our institutions rather stable funding. Our federal budget uh, has increased by <clears throat> um, since two, 2005 when uh, Chancellor Merkel took, took office uh, by 140 uh, percent. Now it's at 18 billion euro and um, uh, um, if you if you combine federal government, federal states, and industry together, that's about 100 billion euro for for R and D. Uh, two thirds of that come comes from industry, so uh, we are currently at three percent of, of GDP and and are aiming at 3.5 uh, in 2025. So that's um, <clears throat> that's the kind of thing I'm I, I like to to talk about. 
um, we, we try to um, um, award um, the federal funds to our universities with a competitive uh, mechanism, which is called the Excellence Strategy, um, which is very successful, goes on now for, for quite um, a number of, of, of um, periods. And um, we, we try to get um, international scientists, especially also from the US, um, to sit in the juries who um, award these uh, these funds. So um, fostering excellence is certainly something that we will manage to do uh, with this uh, with this mechanism. Um, so um, that's um, that's that's usually what I what I try to um, to tell. But of course, then the, the second chapter would be about international cooperation. Um, that's, um... I'll, I'll just briefly mention that uh, I think a face-to-face -face interview or a coffee chat like this is, is a great way to get a lot of formal and informal ideas out. It doesn't always, it's not always conducive to, to numbers uh, or something that would be in the more traditional presentation format. So I would encourage anyone interested in, in the hard numbers to reach out to us at your access and we'll be happy to connect you with a lot of the statistics uh, that are sort of behind the comments uh, that you're making today. Uh, so in terms of international cooperation, as you began to mention, thank you for that great overview of the science landscape. Uh, we've talked a bit about what you as a science diplomat and science counselor do, and then how the embassies and ministries uh, sort of work to make that happen and assist you. In terms of going to the top level, Germany is a country. How, how, is, how important is science uh, for Germany and how open is Germany to international collaboration? Um... Well, and Germany, as as you know, is is a country that is in in general uh, also uh, outside of science very invested in in uh, and committed to international uh, collaboration and um, uh, international institutions. We support um, the, the the work of the WHO um, uh, and other international mechanisms. We will get back to that later, I think. Uh, so multilateralism is certainly key for our foreign policy in general, but um, if you look at our, uh, science diplomacy, um, then um, it's, um, it's also um, important and it's, um, there's an, a connection between both because uh, as the, the US is using science diplomacy a lot to initiate our, um, diplomatic connections and, and uh, uh, to enhance cooperation in, in um, other political fields. And we use it the same way. We have used it, for example, in, um, in Israel, where science cooperation actually started in 1959 uh, with the visit of the Max Planck uh, uh, Society to the Weizmann Institute of Science. Um, and uh, uh, diplomatic relations came much later in 1965. So in a way, uh, the, the science diplomacy was, was preparing uh, the actual uh, diplomatic relations, which, which, which came much later. Um, and um, we, we, we have to be open to international collaboration because um, actually uh, Germany is a, is a comparatively small country. We are uh, about half the size of Texas, uh, not, not in terms of, of inhabitants. We have uh, uh, around 55 million more people, but um, um, the, the, the area is half the size of Texas. And uh, we, have, we don't have much um, raw materials. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Our raw material is, is, is uh, the knowledge, and most of the knowledge is, is generated outside of, of, of Germany, so we have to cooperate internationally in order to foster excellence in our research institutions and, and innovation in our companies. And um, <clears throat> so um, uh, we use international cooperation a lot uh, as, as kind of, uh, if you wish, an added value uh, for enhancing national S&T programs and, and projects uh, through our adding uh, an international uh, component, and uh, we, we are actually quite quite successful. Um, our, our universities and the, the research institutions, like uh, extra university research institutions like Max Planck and Fraunhofer, all have their um, dedicated international uh, strategy, their 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 concept to attract more international students, and um, <clears throat> we. Um, uh, Germany is now at the student level with, with close to 375,000 international students, uh, um, and the top destination in the non-English speaking world after US, UK and, and Australia. And um, um, about 13% of the um, total number of the student population in Germany is, is now from abroad. 
and um, um, at the at the level of researchers, if you want to do research in Germany, actually the the uh, um, numbers are also uh, I find quite impressive. Uh, for example, at the Max Planck uh, Society, Max Planck Institutes, uh, which is our top uh, extra university institution for basic research, uh, uh, fifty two percent. Uh, of the scientists um, have a non-German uh, nationality and at the top level of the institute directors uh, the share of foreign nationals is still 36 uh, percent. Um, most of our funding schemes are open uh, for participation of international researchers and um, <clears throat> also our, our companies um, last but not least are very internationally oriented and surprisingly also the small and medium uh, sized companies um, because uh, they have that maybe they have just a very small niche uh, uh, specialized niche in, in in their markets um, but in this niche they are um, they export uh, worldwide and um, uh, small companies uh, may be even worldwide leaders in a, in a specialized uh, niche that you have never heard of uh, I mean one of my ministers used to, to bring this favorite example of camel shampoo. So these very expensive um, uh, Arab racing camels, uh, they need special shampoo. And there's a, there's a, a company in Germany, I don't want to mention any names, um, which uh, uh, exports these camel shampoos worldwide. Um, that's just one funny example. <laughs> What an interesting example. Uh, so it sounds like Germany's been successful and based on a couple of those examples of attracting international students and scientists, what, what are some other factors that account for this? Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, the most obvious uh, advantage that we have in, uh, in attracting uh, international students is of course uh, that German universities uh, don't charge tuition fees. Um, so, um, uh, we, we have a um, we had a discussion uh, a couple of years ago about uh, introducing tuition fees, and then the uh, our Supreme Court said because Germany is a, a social democracy, um, and, uh, these tuition fees cannot be prohibitive. So what they thought as being prohibitive was above uh, 500 euro, I think per semester or per year. I don't re remember exactly, but th this is about the order of magnitude that I said would not uh, prohibit uh, students from lower income families to uh, to get a university education. Um, we, we try, so no tuition fees, uh, we try to make the language barrier as low as possible. We have many masters, at least at the, at the master's level, uh, we have many um, classes taught in English, uh, about 1,300 uh, um, master courses. Um, uh, we have a very good quality of life I, I should should mention in the middle of Europe so if you want to do some tourism that's uh, perfectly possible um, uh, we make it comparatively easy to enter the, the country for for studying um, and um, as a US uh, citizen you only of course this is all um, well, the pandemic has complicated all this a little bit nice. with this testing and so on. Um, but in, in principle now for students, uh, the conditions are actually quite quite good if uh, ex with the exception of purely online studies, then of course you will not be able to travel. Um, we are also making it uh, a lot easier or have made it easier this year for foreign graduates to stay and work longer in the country. Um, so. Um, uh, that's that's maybe what what I would have usually say, and then as I said, the details are very much uh, up to you to 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 research in connection with the representations of our exchange organizations. Great, uh, overlapping quite a bit with one of our main missions, I'd like to ask you if you could tell us a little bit about the network of German science expats in the U.S. So part of our job at your access, as you know. Uh, is to support the European scientific diaspora's uh, networks. So some European countries don't necessarily have a network of researchers in North America. Others do exist, but sort of as an informal group. Uh, and then there are formal uh, European scientific diaspora groups that are quite formal. They have government support and funding. Uh, but Germany to me stands out as one of the countries that has several organizations. Uh, we mentioned before the example of how the se several ministries cooperate on, on subjects of mutual interest. Um, so several organizations and, and alumni associations, I think, will support German researchers and then German Americans and then non-German researchers that also have some sort of connection to having studied 
uh, in Germany or research in Germany or carrying out collaborative joint research together with Germans? Um, well, uh, if it's about uh, um, organizations and networks of ex German science experts, uh, I should mention GAIN first. That's a German academic international network, um, which currently has over, um, we have uh, um, over 5,000 German scientists in the US. Um, exact numbers are always difficult to get. Um, uh, and, and GAIN is, is a really very efficient network with has, which has local chapters um, in, in uh, regular t uh, tables uh, of, of local chapters, for example, at the NIH, um, there, there's, there's one. Um, uh, they have an annual conference um, in San Francisco or in Boston um, with very high ranking representatives from German government and research institutions, um, uh, like the uh, Minister of Research, sometimes uh, at least the Deputy uh, Minister, all the presidents of our, um, or most of the presidents of our research organizations um, uh, are coming. So you have an opportunity really to, to, to talk to them and to, to see what your career path could be when you return uh, to Germany. Uh, the, the conference had uh, about 700 uh, participants in 2019 in San Francisco. This time it was only virtual because of the, the pandemic, but uh, still um, they, they are all um, um, trying to, to work with these di digital formats and actually uh, this, this one worked uh, quite well. Um, so we are, we are continuing this despite the, the pandemic. And then, of course, uh, so this is a separate network. And then, of course, we have the alumni organization. And the most important, I, I would say, is, is, is the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, because Alexander von Humboldt Foundation is for the more established career researchers. And they have very prestigious awards, which, which go to uh, over, over a million uh, um, and, and, and more. And um, uh, they have um, uh, supporting organizations in the US, American Friends of the Alex Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. They have about uh, 30,000 alumni worldwide, uh, 5,400 in, in the US, um, 55 alumni are Nobel Prize winners. And in the US, I would, for example, name uh, Stephen Chu, who was uh, formerly Secretary of Energy and is now Chair of the Board of the AAAS. So that's, he is a, a Humboldt uh, alumnus. And, uh, and then I, I would name, of course, the DAD, German Academic Exchange Service. Uh, they have a, a um, accumulated um, alumni network of 2 million overall since 1950 uh, in total. And uh, if you look at the, the um, um, alumni events that they do every year, it's, it's uh, in the order of 15,000 um, participants. And also they have a couple of Nobel laureates, 18, I think. So uh, that's, that's maybe the, the, the three most important um, uh, networks. In, uh, in our follow-up email to all the attendees tomorrow, I'll be happy to, to send a list of those networks uh, for some people to take direct contact okay. with those organizations that, or, that or learn more. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll work I, on that. I, I'd like to ask a sort of a series of questions that are all tied into a very topical uh, issue of the pandemic and, and Germany's uh, sort of leadership in that, in the actions it's taken. And then from there, we'll be really happy to jump into some audience questions. So I'd encourage people to start, start thinking of the, the questions they want and submit them now. Uh, so first and foremost, how did Germany, how did Germany and how is Germany faring uh, in the pandemic and what role did science and science diplomacy play? Um, yeah, we are, um, actually we are, we are doing, uh, uh, you, you can't say with a pandemic quite well, but uh, reasonably well under the circumstances. Uh, so we have now a total infections of 264,000. Uh, that's uh, 317 per 100,000 uh, in inhabitants. And uh, we have, um, unfortunately, um, uh, about 9,400 uh, casualties. That's 11 per, per 100,000 in inhabitants. So we have managed to, to keep the, the level of infection uh, relatively low, which has enabled us to um, also um, uh, open our schools, uh, sometimes with masks, sometimes without masks, um, but uh, with, with the necessary precautions. Um, so um, it's, it's difficult uh, to compare. Actually, I don't want to compare this. If, if somebody is interested in comparing, there are even for this, uh, you have ratings. And um, uh, there's a so-called deep knowledge group, a think tank, 
and uh, it it rated Germany number one in Europe after Switzerland in in in, in the last rating from from June. Uh, and we got um, good scorings in monitoring and detection, and that's that's actually um, and in the the government efficiency of the of the risk uh, management. Um, the one of our advantages was that our researchers. Um, uh, developed a test, uh, the first PCR test uh, for for coronavirus, uh, very fast. Uh, I think it was uh, in a, in a matter of days after Chinese researchers published the genome of the, of the virus, that uh, the Charité uh, uh, clinic in in Berlin um, had developed the, the the first test uh, because they were specialists on on coronaviruses, and and I think they they also made it made it available uh, worldwide. Uh, so that that was uh, and and the, the contract tracing also was was quite successful, and um, we we do um, a good job in communicating uh, the science. Uh, there is, for example, a science podcast where this, the the science behind um, uh, uh, testing and and vaccines and so on is really explained in uh, in in I think. I think it's about 45 minutes, and it's it's uh, the, the the professor from the Charité, which um, which I mentioned, uh, who explains uh, what studies are out there, um, are they reliable? Why are they reliable? Um, um, so and and makes it clear that also the scientists don't have the silver bullet and don't know everything. So that's that's uh, something that is uh, that was very helpful. And, and also what helped was that the, the trust that Germans have in their public media is, is comparatively high. So, uh, for example, 67% trust news from our public TV and broadcasting services, 65% uh, trust regional newspapers, 55 the national newspapers. And that has actually increased in the last uh, 10 years. So people don't rely a lot on, on social media information. And uh, that, I think, has, has also helped. Okay, great. Uh, earlier, you talked about the importance of international cooperation for science diplomacy generally, and for your work in terms of the pandemic. How how important is international cooperation? Well, I I, I have to say it was it was really an amazing experience to see how uh, scientists uh, cooperated worldwide to uh, to to fight the pandemic and to exchange their information. And that has been a real privilege. And for example, the the OSTP at the White House also joined in in that effort with a roundtable of virtual roundtable, of course, of of science uh, chief science advisors uh, worldwide. And I think that's that's now um, um, uh, the the NSF is continuing will be continuing this. Um, and um, um, what I, I I personally think, and that's uh, the German policy right now that that um, uh, international cooperation is, is, is ab absolutely crucial because the virus, uh, as has been said frequently, knows no borders and uh, no one is safe until everyone is safe. So um, we have to make uh, vaccines available uh, also for, for the um, poorer countries. And, and that's why, why Germany and the EU um, support the concept of a, of a coronavirus uh, vaccine as a global public good. We support the WHO uh, ACT initiative, so the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator, um, and um, uh, we, we support uh, organizations like CEPI, the, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, and the Global Vaccine Alliance, GAVI. Uh, so um, this, I, I think international cooperation is, is really, really important here. Thank you. Uh, given this is a really interesting time to hold this talk with you, because if I'm not mistaken uh, about the rotating six month presidency of the EU Council, we're right in the middle of, of, of Germany's presidency. Uh, so so given that, how what role does the pandemic play uh, as Germany leads the Council of the European Union? Uh, it, it, it plays a, a very crucial role, and that was, of course, not planned. And uh, the, the preparations for the for the presidency program uh, started long ago, before the pandemic struck. And uh, of course, all these these very important uh, um, uh, initiatives, like in in bioeconomy or cancer research, have to to continue. And we we are of course trying to do that. But now, uh, pandemic, um, the, um, the 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 program. Um, uh, which relates to the pandemic um, has um, um, gained so much in, in importance and the pandemic has become kind of the, the defining challenge for our uh, presidency. And um, 
although it is clear that it will only subside somewhere in 2021 or after the presidency ended. Um, but we have to do our part. And um, um, the, um, uh, it's, it's good to see that the, the heads of, of European governments uh, have now uh, consented on, on the long-term uh, budget uh, from 21, uh, 2021 to 2027 uh, in, in, in the order of a thousand uh, a billion euro. Uh, for, for, for the entire stretch uh, and uh, on, on the recovery plan, which is called Next Generation EU, which, which has 750 billion euro uh, volume. And um, um, the, um, I think in, in order to get out of the, of the pandemic, uh, science and innovation are absolutely crucial. And that this refers not only to the work on, on vaccines and, and, and testing and therapeutics, uh, but, uh, but also the, the, the core um, uh, notion is actually uh, resiliency. To uh, how how do we make our societies more uh, resilient? And uh, this research on resiliency, which uh, which is closely uh, related, of course, to to security research, for example, uh, is is um, is absolutely crucial. We uh, in all our systems, uh, healthcare um, and so on, the, the pandemic has exposed some cracks. And um, we really have to work on, on, on these and to learn from our experiences during the, the pandemic to create the conditions for a more ref, rapid and efficient response to future uh, crises of this, uh, this kind, which will unfortunately um, probably come. Um, and um, one, one aspect is, is, is uh, greater technological sovereignty. Um, Europe needs to strengthen its, its technological and data sovereignty. Uh, we all have seen that our supply chains are quite vulnerable. Same is true for, for the US. Um, and, and we need a more secure communication infrastructures, data spaces, and, uh, and um, uh, research in, in such things as trustworthy microelectronics, also that is, is, is true. And uh, last but not least, um, the, the, the cracks that have been exposed by the pandemic also relate to our educational systems and the way uh, we uh, replace uh, in-person education with uh, uh, distance learning, for example. Well, uh Sort of looping back to the the very initial question or series of questions, I'd just be curious before we transition to the Q and A, and uh, I'd welcome anyone in the audience to begin submitting their questions now. Uh, do you have any favorite memories uh, in, in your science diplomacy career that you'd like to to leave with us? Uh, well, absolutely. I, I have many of of these um, uh, favorite many memories, but I, I would maybe pick one. Um, and that was uh, the start of the European uh, research module, uh, Columbus, uh, to the International Space Station uh, on board the Space Shuttle Atlantis on February 7, uh, 2008. And um, it, um, it had all the, the elements of, of truly uh, great science, so the, 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 the search for new knowledge, because this is a research lab which is now integrated into the, the international a space station it has as as all space research an element of it, adventure and risk as as we know it had um the uh, the persistence uh, of, of of scientists if you uh, think uh, um, that um the planning for this uh, research lab um started in 1985 the construction started in 1996 and uh, the start, as I mentioned, was 2008. So the project went over 23 years. Some people who came to ESA, the European Space Agency, as young scientists uh, were present when, when uh, as um, senior, very senior officials, when the, when the start uh, happened. And I was happy because my ambassador couldn't go. So I was the, the, uh, the, the top. A German uh, representative at, at the start, and we, we were at the so-called OSP2, which is a, 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 the closest observation point for, for the start. And it was um, um, a real uh, in, incredible um, a moment, also because it was an international, it was truly international. I mean, it's, it's anyways, international anyways, because it's a cooperation between NASA and ESA, the, the Europeans and the, and, and the US. Uh, but there were also a German astronaut was on, on board, Hans Schlegel, 
and uh, a French ESA astronaut, uh, um, Leopold Eihard. So it, it was plus plus five US astronauts. So it, it was truly international and it was truly emotional because um, the, uh, the, the, the relief when the, uh, the, the launch had, um, had worked and then the separation of the of the of the boosters of the so solid fuel uh, boosters and finally the, the separation of the main tank and then you know um, actually um, okay this 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 will this will be okay and it, it docked a few days later I think that was on, on uh, uh, February 11. Um, so it, the whole mission was a success, but you you never know, and the tension was uh, and the relief was incredible. So this this uh, this was a great event. I feel like we should work on a, a book, and I just want to make sure I get assigned for first edition because you probably have a lot of stories like this. Uh, thank you so much for that. I, I enjoyed that we kind of came full circle just with with that memory. Uh, I'll I'll continue to invite people to submit questions via the questions box. Uh, we did have a very small number of questions submitted during registration since we enabled that that option. I'll I'll just start with one to give everyone in the audience a moment just while you answer that first one, uh, Christian, uh, to, to formulate their own questions. And I'll also say sometimes these questions are can be really great and uh, and a lot of insights can be gleaned from them. But if they're uniquely specific or highly specific and perhaps not not of immediate relevance or interest to, to a wider audience. Uh, Christiane and I will do everything in our power to respond to you uh, via email after the fact, uh, in, particularly in cases where it requires. Uh, yes, yeah, so check, I, would, checking, I checking would like to follow that. Yeah. Mm -hmm, certainly. Uh, so one question that I think can be, can be interesting to a lot of folks in the audience, someone asks, uh, have you already facilitated bilateral partnerships between universities in the US and Germany? Uh, if so, how did you proceed? And from what side did the demand come first, the US or Germany? And I know, you know, you said this is your second post in the US, uh, but also given the fact that you've been posted to several countries, I'm, I'm not sure if, if there's a more relevant example from, from elsewhere. Um, I have, my, maybe I have to disappoint you a little bit because um, uh, actually uh, German universities, uh, the, the access of German universities uh, and, and uh, is, is so, um, so great uh, to, to their US counterparts uh, that they mostly don't need the embassy to uh, to foster these relationships. There are a few uh, um, examples which I couldn't many name. The, the first one is actually uh, um, an example from an extra university research uh, organization, which is the um, um, uh, the research center in Jülich, um, uh, which belongs to the Helmholtz Association of German Research Centers, and they run our, our big science infrastructures like synchrotrons uh, and and so on. Um, so um, they they established uh, their own uh, lab at Oak Ridge uh, National Lab, and so to to um, uh, help with establishing that that framework, and uh, there was uh, there was an in inauguration ceremony for a certain instrument, uh, um, and and um, this kind of thing. Um, uh, I, I I I help with that. Um, um, my main um, experience with um, fostering uh, university partnerships is actually in Israel. There was a great partnership, or is still a great partnership, between the Free University of Berlin and the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And what they they tried to do is uh, was was um, an, a real uh, establish real online teaching uh, very relevant for for our present situation. Uh, I, I think it was in 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 law, and they tried to um, uh, to establish online classes uh, on a, a, a virtual classroom between uh, Israeli and and German students in in certain law areas, and and that. Uh, that required a, a, a lot of traveling back and forth and talking back and forth. And um, I, I, unfortunately, I don't know how far they, they are, but th this is the kind of partnership. So there, there was a great program by the German Academic Exchange Service to specially uh, enhance partnership uh, partnerships between universities. And we, made, we tried to make use of that program uh, and fit it a little bit with the requirements of a digital uh, teaching environment. So. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll be trying to respond with written messages to, to many of those questions that are coming in, just letting you know if, if your question might be more appropriate just for a one-on-one -on -one email that I'll follow up with you on uh, later. Uh, Christian, a question that came in right before we sort of asked, I asked my series of umbrella questions on uh, on the pandemic and, and Germany's presidency of the EU Council. So maybe you've already answered this to a degree, but perhaps you could give a, sort of a, a general perspective as opposed to uh, a German specific uh, perspective, but someone asks, how is science diplomacy working towards solutions to COVID-19 
where international understanding seems very important to address this global problem. I, I know you touched on it in many ways, but just given given your uh, your background in science, I'm not sure if you have uh, any sort of global perspective as well. Well, as I, I, I mentioned already, that Germany is very much in favor of, of international solutions uh, for the um, um, uh, for for vaccines, especially uh, or also therapeutics uh, against the um, COVID-19. Uh, and uh, there are a number of initiatives. There's uh, the, the EU uh, hosted uh, two two um, big pledging summits, um, and um, uh, so uh, we are of course trying. Uh, to get as many countries to join this or the, the, the newly established COVAX facility, which, uh, which is supposed to, to help uh, um, uh, developing countries, poorer countries, to, to get uh, vaccines, a sufficient amount of vaccines. Um, we support this and, and, and also we, 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 of course, work with um, organizations like CEPI, which I mentioned, or Gavi, uh, to, uh, to get um, um, international support. Uh, this is quite successful. Um, the US has at least not yet uh, joined um, uh, these efforts in, in, uh, to, to the full extent. So um, there's certainly room for the science diplomacy there as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, let's see. One question that that may we may not be able to answer here, just given sort of the separate uh, areas of responsibility of embassies and consulates regards uh, consular processing and how everything's been affected by the pandemic. Uh, so I'll, I'll encourage that asker uh, just to see if, if he or she is able to, to take uh, direct contact with, with his or her local consulate uh, in the US. That's, that's uh, a question then... that's, uh, that's, that's worrying uh, us a, a great deal because of course, due to the pandemic, the capacities of, of con general consulates, uh, and, and we, we have a consulate here, um, a consulate section of the of the embassy as well, um, uh, to to a process uh, visas has, has um, uh, decreased a lot during the, the pandemic, and I think the same is true for U.S. consulates in in, in Germany. Uh, so that that's uh, definitely a problem. Yeah. Um. Someone asked, and this this may be a question uh, where you, sort of your counterparts in in GAIN and DAD and similar organizations uh, may be well positioned to answer. But someone asks, what is Germany's strategy to attract and incentivize top scientists to return back to Germany instead of staying in the U.S.? Hmm. Um, there are um, there are a couple of um, um, uh, initiatives. Um, first of all. Um, we tr we try to um, to fashion our um, uh, funding programs in a way that gives uh, um, people an incentive to return. For example, um, we, we have programs that um, uh, finance your stay uh, abroad. For example, in a research stay in the U.S., uh, but on condition that afterwards you return to to Germany, and uh, this is connected with certain benefits you get to establish your own research group, for example, uh, in uh, at a German research institution. Uh, so, so many 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 programs are um, a little bit like that. So that's that's one um, uh, that's one thing, um, and. Um, um, tenure track is is uh, is very often uh, a question. So we have increased uh, the um, um, the number of tenure track positions at German universities because uh, that that's that's essentially an incentive to return. Um, and there's a, um, a federal program for that, and we hope that uh, now the federal states, which are um, responsible for financing and in many cases hiring. Uh, the professors um, uh, to um, uh, to do uh, the same and and also to to put more money into these these tenure track positions. So uh, yes, uh, there there are programs which are uh, designed um, for for this um, for getting our researchers back. And by the way, also this, this is only true in the other direction. So we we don't want to to install a, a brain. A drain from from other countries, especially not from developing countries, who need their own scientists back uh, after after their training in in Germany. So I, I we really like to uh, talk about, about a brain circulation and not uh, not a brain brain. Great. Well, I think for the most part that seems to be every question. Someone does ask uh, a great question about science science diplomacy and the Arctic. 
Uh, and in that case, you and I, Kristen, will uh, I'll allow you to to do a little bit of research on that since it involves specific events and ministerials. Uh, so to that person, we'll we'll be really happy to follow up with you. Uh, I would encourage you for for any future activities to, to please email us at your access. You'll be getting an automated message from us uh, tomorrow. I'll be dropping in the chat right before we wrap up uh, a link to the event page that you found originally to sign up for this, just because we'll update that uh, with a list of, of the organizations that Christian mentioned earlier uh, and hopefully a recording of today's video. Uh, so Christian, I'll, I'll leave a moment to you to sort of, if you have any, any additional comments on uh, my quick comment on the Arctic or any closing remarks, I'll be happy to leave it to you. And then I'll just mention next month's uh, virtual coffee chat and then wrap up. I would just say that um, the, the Arctic question illustrates what uh, another task that we do very frequently, which is uh, um, uh, looking for the experts in Germany, which, uh, for example, may be found at the uh, Division for, for Ocean and Arctic Research of the Ministry of Research. Uh, and then we, uh, we, we contact these um, um, colleagues and, and and try to get the information from there because we with, with the small staff that we have we can't we can't answer every um uh, every detail and um so that's that's part of our job so i, okay, I, I will be happy to do that uh, i'm also leaving the Euraxis uh email that my colleague and i share which which reaches both of us in addition to messaging us contactly uh contacting us directly uh, people are welcome to to message us there so let me just send that in the chat uh, again you'll get the follow-up email that you can reply to directly uh, and i'll be i'll be reviewing all those responses when it goes out tomorrow um and then finally i'll put one more link in the chat for those attending live um right now so we're very thankful to have you today uh, i'll mention that next month we'll be having an interview with anouk de Bast, the head of the office of science technology and higher education at the swiss embassy to the u.s which will be our first chat with a non-European Union member state. Uh, so you'll also get a link and details to that in tomorrow's follow-up email. Uh, but again, Christian, thank you so much. I, I know we'll be following up with, with however many people we can uh, via email. And I, I hope you enjoyed getting, getting your message out to a lot of people. I certainly learned a lot. And if I had more time, uh, I'd, I'd continue for another hour. But thank you so much again. It was great fun. Thank you very much.